you are literally like fighting for my home. So thank you. Um, I'd, I'd like to talk more, but I think I'm gonna start crying pretty soon. So thank you. Cause this, this is the area that we've been in for many, many years, right? And for them to come in and tear it up for temporary profit really does suck. It's a big bummer, you know, especially when they don't see us. Because what happens with a lot of this is all the papers that are signed, it's out of sight, out of mind. They don't see us. They don't see that we have to breathe in these gases or we have to deal with these safety violations that happen out there. We as residents have to deal with this 24-7 because this activity takes place 24-7. It's not an 8 to 5 Monday through Friday job. <laughs> and I think um, people need to know that, that it's just these these stresses that we go through every day shouldn't be there. And these stresses are new. Okay, so thank you. Thank all, I really thank all of you. We understand that climate change poses a grave and growing danger to the future. What we are now also coming to understand is that the climate crisis is the greatest threat to human rights the world has ever seen. Right to life, health, and security of person are being violated. Not just will be violated, but already are massively violated all around the world. Governments, the very institutions charged with protecting their citizens' rights, are not only failing spectacularly to meet that responsibility, but are deeply complicit in those violations. It's hard to know where to turn. So I was paying attention when my colleagues told me that they were calling for a special session of an international human rights tribunal to hear a rights-based case against fracking and climate change. The tribunal would bypass state and local authorities and appeal directly to universal standards of human decency. The organization I head the Spring Creek Project at Oregon State University stepped in to help stage the tribunal, bringing together the international panel of judges, the eyewitness testimony from people on the front lines of fracking, and the arguments of human rights attorneys and moral thought leaders from around the world. In 2018, we live streamed the tribunal, a global first, with the intent to involve as many voices as possible, as equitably as possible rich and poor, near and remote. After a long deliberation, the tribunal has issued its ruling. It reaches damning conclusions about the human rights violations of oil and gas companies, undeterred, in fact, enabled by governments. The tribunal's ruling offers powerful, transformative, and desperately needed new tools to help rein in governments and corporations that have so far been operating with few legal or moral constraints. It does this in two important ways. First, the ruling is a determination by a respected international court that fracking and climate change constitute massive violations of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And second, the rights-based narrative reveals that fracking and climate change are grave issues of environmental justice. The human rights story could start anywhere in the world, but let's start in the Bakken oil fields of North Dakota. Oil is dirty business. In the Bakken, spills, pipeline breaks, and well blowouts are frequent. According to the New York Times, between 2006 and 2014, an estimated 18.4 million gallons of oil and chemicals were spilled, leaked, or misted into the air, soil, and waters of North Dakota. Since 2014, a study of incident reports shows that spills, large and small, continue to happen at a rate of one every 1.7 days. And all of this in a rural region where most people depend on well water, groundwater. If you drive through the Bakken, you will see flares coming out of the ground beside the pump jacks, emitting fumes that deliver payloads of CO2 into the atmosphere, along with sulfur dioxide and other carcinogens. Communities of color and low-income communities are more likely to live, live 
near multiple sources of greenhouse gases and other pollutants. They often call these pollution burden communities sacrifice zones because the communities that are host to coal plants, oil refineries, and more, they sacrifice, we sacrifice the health, the well-being, and often the very lives of our residents so that the nation can waste 80% of the energy it generates. We knew we couldn't say we didn't know, except what's certain. Benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene, volatile organic compounds, and diesel fuel, around 1% per gallon used in the Bakken shale, plus the radium inert in the rocks brought back up in the fracking fluid after it's made its long journey below to gather the oil and then brought topside to be separated out and shipped to wastewater centers where it's treated, cleaned, in condensate tanks, some of them lined, some unlined, seeping into the ground, toxins evaporating into the air, What's left over, uncleanable, trucked in water tankers to be disposed of, re-injected into the land previously known as a way. Beyond groundwater contamination, now earthquakes in Colorado, Arkansas, the swath of states between Alabama and Montana, a six-fold increase over 20th century levels at least a dozen quakes last year in Northern Ohio, one measuring up to 4.8 on the Richter scale. Speculation about the 30,000 disposal sites around the country where fracking wastewater is deposited, re-injected for final disposal into a deeper layer known as the basement rock. The speculation about fracking itself, deep underground explosions to extract oil, the water causing shifting plates, lubricating faults, look for damage to homes, look for reports of contaminated drinking water, look for increases in breast cancer, miscarriages, birth defects. We knew, we couldn't say, we didn't know, ground zero. These facts alone along with emerging evidence revealing that fracking sites and associated fracking infrastructure are disproportionately cited in non-white, low-income indigenous communities, both in the United States and in countries like Argentina, Mexico, and Canada, where fracking has been exported, means that it is right and necessary to understand the potential for human exposures and accompanying adverse impacts not only as an issue of public health, but fundamentally as an issue of human rights. Now, it isn't only activists calling out these human rights abuses. For the first time in history, an international human rights court has ruled that fracking and climate change systematically violate human rights. The Rome-based Permanent People's Tribunal Special Session on Human Rights, Fracking, and Climate Change has established the link between environmental destruction and human rights violations. Here are four of their central findings. First, the tribunal ruled that fracking and climate change create serious and catastrophic violations of human rights that are inherent in the industry. Here are the words from the advisory opinion. It is impossible for the fracking system to respect rights of humans or non-humans including those of land and water, as well as that of humans to health, life, free expression, or a clean environment. The rights violations of fracking and climate change are connected in a vicious circle. Heavy investment in fracking infrastructure militates against innovation in renewable energy. The slowing of renewables development leads to increased dependence on fracking, and so on. So, the tribunal ruled that fracking should be banned worldwide. Second, the tribunal addressed the inherent injustice of fracking practices. The system of laws regulating fracking is underpinned, accompanied and permeated by racism and colonialism, 
The frontiers that make fracked gas cheap are constituted in part by frontiers of injustice, dividing black and white, indigenous and non-indigenous, rural and privileged urban dweller. Fracking is economically feasible only because it legally devalues the lifeways and history of the people displaced by fracking. Thus fracking, in the court's judgment, could not be made non-racist or non-colonialist without incurring costs that the industry is just unable to tolerate. Third, the tribunal pointed to the industry strategies for overriding the rights and objections of people in frontline communities. For fracking to exist, strategies for cheating, undermining and expropriating affected communities must be coordinated in a cost-effective way across large land areas. The technical requirements for mass ruthlessness across the fracking frontier create incentives for the development and maintenance of extensive institutions for control of thought and other action. The secrecy of operations is all that allows the deadly, large-scale experiments in poisoning humans and non-humans that the fracking industry is currently conducting in violation of the Nuremberg Code. And fourth, rather than protecting the rights of their citizens from rights violations, governments actively join with extractive corporations to permit serious violations. Governments and extractive industries are joined in an axis of betrayal, the tribunal wrote. Such violations committed by megacorporations for the most part are done either under what have become symbolic environmental laws that have been implemented to allow practices, or in violation of such laws but with impunity from the state. Nation states have invariably been bought off by the extractivist industries in the name of ersatz development. The tribunal's ruling is a global affirmation that when climate change and the extraction techniques that fuel it directly harm the rights of human beings to life, liberty, and security of person, then deeply and broadly accepted moral norms have been violated, including those encoded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. For more about what the tribunal's opinion means, I spoke with the co-editors of Bearing Witness, the human rights case against fracking and climate change, a book that's based on the testimony and rulings from this tribunal. The editors are Tom Kearns, co-drafter of the Declaration on Human Rights and Climate Change, and Kathleen Dean Moore, author of Great Tide Rising, Toward Clarity and Moral Courage in a Time of Planetary Change. First, I asked Kathleen about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that the tribunal cited in its opinion. 70 years ago, the world saw that when human rights violations are legal under the laws of nations, as the atrocities were in Nazi Germany, you have to have some overriding international law to call governments to account. So the nations of the world came together and reached unanimous agreement about minimal standards of human decency. They encoded them in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. For the first time in human history, it called on states to protect everyone's rights to life, liberty, and security of person. This is extraordinary, the closest the world has ever come to a global moral consensus about what is worthy of us as human beings. These are moral standards against which the world can measure the actions of governments. I asked Tom to tell us a little about the Permanent People's Tribunal and how he got them to hold a special session that would measure fracking and climate change against these moral standards that Kathleen mentioned. The Permanent People's Tribunal is a remarkable institution. It's politically and economically independent, which is exactly what you want in a human rights court. It was founded in 1979, about a decade after the Vietnam War Crimes Tribunals that had been organized by philosophers Bertrand Russell and Jean-Paul Sartre. That tribunal inspired the formation of the Permanent People's Tribunal, an international human rights court now based in Rome. In its 40 plus years of existence, 
hearing 40 some human rights cases against governments. It has developed an impressive body of human rights jurisprudence that it can draw on now. And its judgments are recognized and respected all around the world. Starting in 2014 and for the rest of that year, Anna Greer and I, Anna is the founder of the Global Network for the Study of Human Rights and the Environment, along with Damien Short, who's the director of the Human Rights Consortium at the University of London, began petitioning the Permanent People's Tribunal to take on this case. That process back and forth took over a year and was finally approved in the spring of 2015. As Tom explained, this International Human Rights Court has a long history of hearing human rights cases and is well respected around the world. But an international court has no power to compel action. So I asked Tom and Kathleen what difference the ruling could make. It is true that a civil society court like the Permanent People's Tribunal has no enforcement powers. The UN United Nations uh, International Court of Justice also does not have enforcement powers. Public truth-telling really does matter. Giving public voice to wrongs matters. Speaking for those who have no voice matters. And the function of a tribunal is to do just that. Gandhi called it satyagraha, or truth force. It's the power of truth telling and truth showing to move, awaken, and compel so that, as Pope Francis says, the world can hear the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. So the judge's advisory opinion makes clear that it is courts like these that help develop the critical moral and legal standards referred to in the literature as uh, soft law. And it's soft law that helps judges in national courts to better understand and interpret and apply the harder statutes of domestic law. This tribunal didn't mince words. It listened to the stories of the witnesses and then told the big truth that has been distorted and hidden behind lies. Which truth? This one. It makes no sense to allow an industry that is unnecessary, known not to be sustainable for the long term, and inherently abusive of human and nature's rights to continue operating, especially its irrational and potentially catastrophic when we consider its inevitable contribution to climate change and water scarcity at a time when there is an urgent necessity to adopt policies that will save the planet. That's a direct quote from the advisory opinion. So what has long been considered normal corporate behavior is suddenly revealed as profoundly abnormal, irrational, and unjust. This dramatically undercuts the social license of the oil and gas industry to run roughshod over people's rights, rights knowingly, intentionally, and systematically violated. Let's single out a couple rights and dive into the details here. What rights in particular do fracking and climate change violate? And how? We'll focus on the right to health, the right to clean water, the rights of indigenous peoples, and the right to be informed and to participate. For each of these, we turn to legal reporting on the tribunal, including direct quotes from the advisory opinion written by the panel of judges, and to eyewitness accounts from the hearing. Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights guarantees everyone the right to a standard of living adequate to the health and well-being of themselves and their families. State parties to the present covenant recognize the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, Article 12. In addition, the right to health underpins the right to life, liberty and security of person guaranteed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. But the judges found that violations of the right to health are not only widespread, 
but inherent in the nature of climate change and the practice of fracking itself. Hi, my name is Pramila Malik. I am the chair of Protect Orange County and a resident of Minisink, New York, a once pristine rural residential community in upstate New York. And uh, it's also home to many 9-11 first responders who moved here for clean air. In 2012, FERC approved a 12,260 horsepower gas compressor station to be built just a few hundred feet from many, many homes, dozens of homes. FERC never rejects a project, so it was approved despite evidence of imminent human and environmental harm. Since it's become operational, we've had frequent odor events, after which children in our community experience nosebleeds, breathing problems, headaches, abdominal cramps, and rashes. Adults report breathing problems. I get breathing problems, and I have no history of respiratory illness before this was built. People also report difficulty concentrating and losing balance. Many families have left. One walked away from their home entirely and left the state. In its advisory opinion, the tribunal ruled that any proposed industrial operations, especially those that will be sited and conducted near private properties, family homes or neighborhoods, should be required to undergo independent health impact assessments. Failure to anticipate and consider health impacts, they implied, constitutes a failure of government's human rights obligations and a direct threat to people's right to health. The General Assembly recognizes the right to safe and clean drinking water and sanitation as a human right that is essential for the full enjoyment of life and all human rights. United Nations Resolution 64-292 The Tribunal writes that the right to clean water is essential for the full enjoyment of life and all human rights. They go on to say that through its explosive disruption of subsurface geological layers, fracking unavoidably spreads heavy metals and radioactive substances into water sources and other locations. The contamination of water cannot be measured and it cannot be reversed. Surface spills and backflow of hydraulic fracturing fluids and problems with lining and slurry seals, which allow the migration of gas to freshwater aquifers, represent the greatest threats to water resources, although not the only ones. They wrote, of the 240 chemicals used or created during the fracking process whose biological effects on humans have been studied, 157 or 65 percent are reproductive or developmental toxins. Another 781 chemicals used in fracking lack toxicity data altogether. Simona Perry, a social scientist and human rights activist, has had the privilege of sitting at kitchen tables and in local restaurants with rural people in the fracking fields, listening to their hopes and fears. Over the course of the past eight years, water coming from private drinking water wells in Bradford County, Pennsylvania, has turned from clear and clean, with little to no total dissolved solids, to white, black, purple, rusty orange, even fizzing and gelling, and in a few cases, the water has disappeared entirely. These changes are sometimes accompanied by this strange smell that one farmer aptly described to me as death. This leads Sandra Steingraber to point out that no technology exists to turn fracking waste back into drinkable water. She asks a question worth considering. What does it mean, practically and morally, for humans to make fresh water disappear? We've never done that before, to actually remove water from the hydrologic cycle, groundwater that, that is the mother of rivers that flow to the sea, that evaporate into clouds, that fall as rain or snow and rise again as mist and fog. We've never done that before. In 
indigenous peoples have the right to the conservation and protection of the environment and the productive capacity of their lands and territories. United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 29. Indigenous peoples have the right to determine and develop priorities and strategies for the development or use of their lands or territories and other resources. United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, Article 32, Section 1. If climate change threatens or undermines indigenous peoples' ability to protect and live on traditional lands, to rely on traditional means of subsistence and travel and to continue cultural practices related to their land, then their right to the conservation and protection of the environment and of their lands or territories has been abrogated and states have failed to meet their human rights obligations. I mean, my name is Winona LaDuke and I'm from the White Earth Reservation in northern Minnesota. First, I just want to start with gratitude and about wealth. The Creator gave us this really beautiful world to live in. And the Creator gave my people this beautiful place to live and to protect. So I always try to be mindful that our decisions we make in our community today are going to be decisions that are going to affect generations ahead. So they say in each deliberation, we should consider the impact upon the seventh generation from now. That's what we're trying to do. The displacement of people caused by climate change is going to be the greatest human rights challenge of our times. And the indigenous peoples of Alaska are some of the first peoples in the world who are facing the excruciating choice of figuring out where they will be able to go um, because they are no longer, many of the communities along the coast of Alaska are no longer able to stay where they have lived for millennia because it is no longer safe. And the ways that human rights are impacted include everything from the right to life to the right to be able to practice cultural traditions and the right to subsistence. And this past winter season between October of 2017 and February of 2018, there were 42 storms that impacted these communities. And again, without the Arctic sea ice, they experienced tremendous flooding and erosion, which is causing the land on which they live to permanently disappear. An indigenous representative from a prior Permanent People's Tribunal session spoke to the judges about the necessity of the land to their cultural survival. The land, which was given to us from the beginning, is what sustains our coexistence. As native indigenous peoples, in that territory there are the norms that we must fulfill as representatives of a specific culture. Each and every one of the places of our history are components of what we call ancestral territory. A sacred space that nourishes, strengthens and gives us existence on this planet. Each party shall guarantee the rights of access to information, public participation in decision-making, and access to justice in environmental matters. Address Convention Article 1 Any person whose rights or freedoms are violated shall have an effective remedy, notwithstanding that the violation has been committed by persons acting in an official capacity. International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, Article 23A. The advisory opinion of the tribunal singled out the rights to information and to participation for special mention. These cut to the heart of the matter. This is about power. This is about who has a voice. This is about powerful corporations bullying and ignoring the people and the land that they are destroying, silencing people, denying them any information, arresting them when they protest. These tactics undermine every right to self-determination. 
The tribunal affirmed that governments have a human rights obligation to provide a safe and enabling environment in which individuals and groups can operate free from threats, harassment, intimidation and violence, can enjoy freedom of expression, association and peaceful assembly in relation to environmental matters and can have effective, timely access to environmental information. However, they said, possibly the most consistent finding of all the presentations of cases has been the generalized planned exclusion of the human communities involved from any information and adequate discussion on the planned and ongoing fracking activities. This is an unacceptable violation of the right to informed participation. For example, they said, the fracking industry systematically uses the law to suppress information about potential or actual ecosystem effects, gag orders, non-disclosure agreements and the strategic lawsuits against public participation are routine across the fracking frontier. Less formal means of biasing or preventing the public discussion include physical intimidation, informal censorship of information presented by fracking critics, false advertising, deliberate failure to investigate complaints, the subversion, manipulation and marginalization of those procedures for public participation in decision-making that are still required by law and entrenched patterns of intellectual bullying. Resistance and open protest generate new waves of rights violations, this time of civil and political rights, to liberty and security, to a fair trial, to freedom of expression and assembly and association. I hear their stories. I cry with them because their rights have been violated. They are denied access to information. They have to go through armed guards with dogs to go to a public meeting. This is America. That is a human rights violation. The tribunal, the legal experts, and the courageous eyewitnesses have given us a clear vision of collusion of governments and fossil fuel companies. This collusion clearly increases the greenhouse gas emissions that fuel climate change. In what threatens to be the greatest violation of human rights the world has ever seen. Everyone we've heard from has taught us the value of bringing a human rights lens to truly see the actions of government collusion with extreme energy extraction. To get a deeper understanding of the importance of this case, I asked Tom and Kathleen to share some of the key things they learned while they were working on the Bearing Witness book. One thing I learned, or rather relearned, is the global importance and the personal empowerment of public truth-telling. A tribunal has this crucially important function to listen and heed the truth-telling testimony of personal witnesses. People were sobbing in the corridors after some of the pre-tribunals held in frontline communities because this was the first time anyone had actually listened to their stories of the real damage that fracking was visiting on them. When ordinary people come forward and say their truth, say what they see with their own eyes, describe what they and their families have been living through, then the untruths of industry's fatuous assurances become abundantly evident. This is all about the power of bearing witness. You want to know what is the reality on the ground? A truly public, truly unbiased hearing is a good way to find out. Anna Greer, one of the legal experts who testified, called this decolonizing the imagination. Escaping from the blinders imposed by a dominant culture and seeing things as they really are. This has the potential to create change from the people, from the conscience of the streets, from what Anna called the restless politics of the possible. A non-governmental civil society court like the Permanent People's Tribunal may not be able to directly compel changes in behavior, but it can certainly change how we think. A human rights court can change what people understand to be acceptable behavior, 
and what they recognize as unacceptable. It can help people see that wrecking the world is not normal, that dismantling the sources of our sustenance is absurd, and that dishonoring whole classes of people, present and future, is just plain reprehensible. Boston University scholar Ibram X. Kendi draws the connections this way. I'm paraphrasing. It's not possible to frack without wrecking the land. It's not possible to wreck the land without destroying the livelihoods and homes of people. It's not possible to destroy people's livelihoods and homes without devaluing their way of life. It's not possible to devalue entire ways of life without devaluing also the people. And that, he points out, is racism. And so the tribunal drew the connection between social justice and environmental justice, each a necessary condition for the other. The tribunal wrote, today there is a silent war by the industry with its political, financial, and media allies against the ecosystem. The assault is directed at Mother Earth, while people are the collateral damage. Understand that we're all in this together, no matter our species, our race, our homeland, our hemisphere, and you strengthen the critical alliance between activists for social justice and activists for ecological thriving. We've come to a fuller and very disturbing understanding of the deep double wrongs that governments are inflicting. Governments are first failing to protect our rights, and second, just when those rights are vulnerable and crumbling, they take an active part in violating them. Philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer calls double wrongs of this sort treachery. And so we learn that although the climate crisis is, of course, a technological problem, a national security problem, an economic problem, it is fundamentally a moral problem. It calls us to summon the moral power of justice, of shared standards of decency, and of a vision of a future that protects the dignity and dreams of all, equitably, human and nature, north and south, present and future. Our action will decide what will become of the people and the sacred places. What will become of your sacred places? What will become of the prairie dog, the wolf, the wild horses, the eagle, the meadowlark, the fox, the elk, the pronghorn antelope, the rare mountain lion, the roads, the air, the topsoil, your people, your people, what will become of the water? Thank you.